It's new media's sky is falling moment. Instead of the promised golden age, we're seeing rolling cutbacks and massive layoffs at digital darlings like Vice and BuzzFeed. Is that it for workers' rights? Are unions any match for advertising pressure from Google and Facebook? We'll talk to organizers this week on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. 2018 was the worst year in media in a decade. Thousands of workers lost their jobs at old-fashioned newspapers and newfangled digital media firms alike. Layoffs nearly tripled over the year before, and this year is not looking good either. Job cuts announced in January alone were up nearly 50%. BuzzFeed, once a digital darling, recently laid off 15% of its workforce, sending shockwaves through the newsroom. Its editorial staff then announced that a union was forming. To quote them, we want to remain spry and competitive, the union said in a statement, but we reject the argument that we must choose between freelancing in a hellscape gig economy for vampirical platforms or submitting to the whims of a corporation. Here to discuss the situation at BuzzFeed in particular and the industry at large are Albert Samaha, an investigative reporter and union stalwart at BuzzFeed News, Nastaran Mohit, organizing director of the News Guild of New York, which is the biggest local and the largest union for news professionals, that's the National News Guild, and labor reporter and union organizer Kim Kelly. Welcome all. Well, if you can't all sort this out, I don't know who can. Let's start with what brought you to journalism. I always think we're very critical of journalism and we sometimes forget why people go into it in the first place. Kim. Me. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, writing is the one thing I've always been good at. And I grew up in a very like poor, rural, under-resourced area and learning to read very early and getting into writing is kind of what got me out. Poor, which poor rural under-resourced area? How much you know about Jersey? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, no, okay. I'm, from, uh, I'm from the Pine Barrens, which mm -hmm. is a, like, a, essentially like a million acre nature preserve in the middle of southern, south central New Jersey. And I'm from Chatsworth, which is an unincorporated community in the middle of it. Not a lot of kids who grow up the way I do get out and get to tell other people's stories and get to tell their own stories. So that's something that was really important to me. And I spent uh, 16 years writing about heavy metal yeah. and, because that's my other love. But in the past, I guess, three to four years, as I've become very involved in, uh, well, Vice's organization efforts and then the greater labor movement, I've kind of pivoted a little bit towards covering those issues as well. Mm. So, you know, Al, but what, what did you imagine that life in journalism was going to be like? And when, did you remember, when do you remember it first appealing to you? Really, uh, since as far back as I can remember almost, I grew up you know, reading the sports section, Sports Illustrated growing up, and as I got older, I started to read more social justice, sorts of journalism, and, and I think you know, I was very curious about the world, and I saw the world as a deeply unfair place. Um, I love to write, and I love to tell stories, and I saw that the stories that were kind of going on around me uh, where I was growing up weren't really being told out um, as much as I thought they should be. Um, and, and so it just made sense to me. I hadn't really, other than playing in the NFL, there hadn't been other, any other career path in my vision. <laughs> um, and, and I think, you know, really from the time of high school and on, I'd just been focused on how can I kind of tell these valuable stories that in any way might try to reveal why the world is unfair and mm. how to change it. Mm. And Nasran, how do you intersect with this story? How does it, was journalism something in your life or was it union organizing? It was always union organizing. Um, I started to uh, organize about 15, 16 years ago, um, really just starting out in the service sector, working as a waitress and a bartender and starting to organize some of my colleagues. And um, over the years, I had the opportunity to organize in different industries, organizing with, with teachers and nurses, domestic workers. Um, and I started to work with the News Guild about five years ago. Um, and have been doing that full time mm. ever since. Well, five years ago was a brilliant time to come into journalism. I mean, what an incredible decade it has been, both on the good and the bad. Extraordinary explosion of possibility on the digital side, tremendous tremors of crisis just about everywhere else. I think what we want to talk about in this conversation is how these tremors have now hit digital, which was mm. supposed to be this sort of dreamscape and where all the resources had gone to when they left the legacy press. Mm -hmm. So who wants to talk about where we are right now? Kim, do you want to sort of oh, kick gosh. things off? 
It'll mm -hmm. be difficult to discuss without lapsing into profanity. <laughs> but <laughs> we're in a place, it feels like, um, you know the story of the Pied Piper? Yeah. It feels like the Pied Piper has come mm -hmm. back to collect his due. Mm -hmm. Meaning all those rats? There's a lot of rats. <laughs> I'll give you that much. Um, I mean, we're at a point where, like you said, like digital media was where the money was, as well. You know, the hot, sexy, new era of journalism. Mm -hmm. And now the money it belongs to Google and Facebook because they control all of the advertising revenue and that essentially dictates what digital publishers are able to do. The pivot to video, that was such a great, wonderful, innovative thing that hit about, what, a year, year and a half ago, has been a massive, it's decimated so many publications in so many sectors of the industry because we found out that wasn't true. We are being swindled and thousands of people lost their jobs because a couple of rich tech people decided to lie to some other rich people and all of us at the bottom were let go. Wait, unpack that a little bit more. What do you mean that we were lied to and swindled? The Facebook algorithm, I'm not, you know, I'm not a social media expert, but I have enough friends who are that told me a little bit about the process. They were, we were sold this new Facebook algorithm was going to make it. Well, well, what they were doing is they wanted to make it so that users of Facebook could see, like, their, their grandchildren or, like, argue with their racist uncle about Trump. Like, right. see fun stuff like that. Yeah, this was supposedly their response, yeah. their responsible response yeah, they to wanted, the crisis of election year. Right, and then they wanted to show us those sort of more personal things. So digital publishers they weren't able to get as much traffic because they're, they was just sort of pushed down. And that's why so many publishers started to rely on video because Facebook told them video is the next thing. Remember Facebook Live? People hired Facebook Live, like, like workers. Like it was a whole thing. It was supposed to revolutionize the industry. And it was, you know, a sandcastle. It was yeah, just an yeah. absolute sandcastle. Mm -hmm. Like it all just disappeared once the tide came back in. And now all of those people that were hired to do video and all of the people that were laid off that were in the more editorial side, like they're all screwed. Because, and Mark Zuckerberg is still having a great time. The head of Facebook, I'm coming to you, Albert. I mean, BuzzFeed was not short of cash. It had raised, what, $500 million? 400 million of it from Comcast? Where did all that money go and why is it now laying people off? I, I think kind of one of the, 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 the challenges we face now is that for, you know, when I first got to BuzzFeed about four plus years ago, um, kind of the, the, the model that had, the business model that we were so optimistic by, this idea that um, even though news itself might not be able to, you know, crack the code of, of how to be profitable, we had this entire operation around this that, that had cracked that code. Um, because of that, obviously, there was all this venture capitalist money that led to probably my hiring and a lot of people who came after me. Um, but those, you know, uh, that, that money was based off of yeah. projections that I think, um, in hindsight, maybe were not realistic. Um, uh, and what changed was, I think, when that money was coming in and when that growth was happening, um, I, we, you know, I can't speak for the people making the decisions, but, but it seems like they may have underestimated uh, the degree to which really the tech companies uh, have the control in the situation mm. and, and, that, and that so much of our business model relies um, on what we're able to get uh, from the tech model. I mean, like, even though many of these... Uh, situations in digital media are new, the problems are age old, right? It's still a matter of advertising funds that aren't there. But, I mean, Nastaran, coming to you, I mean, venture capital, they're on an adventure. Mm -hmm. they, they knew this wasn't a sure thing. How come it's people like Albert, not Albert, but people like him were getting let go? Yeah. Well, I think, I think the explosion and the expansion in digital media mimics the expansion and explosion in many other industries where you have um, you have venture capitalists coming into an industry where they see or think that they can turn a significant profit. And as Kim already laid out, and Albert did as well, these were really outsized projections. Um, and what we're seeing now is this bubble bursting. And this, this bubble has been bursting for some time. We're just seeing the heart, maybe the hardest part, the, the most difficult period now where we're seeing layoff after layoff after layoff or hundreds of jobs are being hemorrhaged. Um, and I think that fundamentally we have investors in media who do not care at all about journalism. Right. Um, they have absolutely no interest in local reporting, in the craft of journalism. They don't want these stories to be told because the same private equity partners that are coming in and pillaging these news organizations are, already, are also pillaging our communities. They're pillaging our hospitals and our schools. Um, and so these are, you know, if you look at Alden Capital, which is one of the big hedge funds that is now going after Gannett. Gannett is yeah. one of the biggest publishers in the country. 
Um, these are, you know, Heath Freeman, you know, anyone can do a rudimentary Google search of this guy and you see what kind of characters we're looking at. And we actually had a group of journalists last year fly into New York City from the Denver Post to go straight to the Alden, uh, Alden headquarters to protest. Um, you know, it had happened to them at the Post. Because it had happened, it completely decimated the newsroom of the Denver Post. We're talking about asset stripping. Absolutely. I mean, stripping to the bone. And so I think in many ways this is, um, I, you know, I, I don't want to use the term unprecedented because I think we do have to view this within a historical context that media has gone through many different phases and uh, periods of growth and contraction. Um, certainly when print started to lose all of those adver advertising dollars, we lost thousands of jobs in the 90s. And that was, and, and it was, it re so many of these publications were really stripped to the bone. What's interesting to me though is, we'll come to unionization in a second, but when we talk about assets, we're mm -hmm. still seeing people like Alden, the, the corp mm -hmm, capital mm -hmm. like Alden and others, sort of like the Sinclair group on, on the television side, buying up these old legacy papers, mm -hmm. buying up these local newspapers that have been around for decades, there's still some assets there, which is interesting to yep. me. Uh, assets enough that they're curious about. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the statistics on subscriptions, and we'll come back to digital in a second, those old papers, the ones where we said there was no value left, mm -hmm. have stayed fairly consistent, even though Absolutely. advertising's quadrupled, news reporting's mm -hmm. shrunk. There's mm -hmm. something about local papers people still like. Absolutely. I mean, communities still want, the public still wants to read the news, whether it's print or digital. We know that print revenue has gone down and print circulation has gone down. But at the end of the day, there is value and there are assets to mine within these newsrooms. And so it's not just about turning this enormous profit. It's also about looking, it's not just the players that are investing in these media companies and these smaller news and gobbling up these smaller newspapers. They're also going in and looking at the staff sometimes it is a unionized staff, they're going in and they're seeing how they can do more with less. So what, why do you need to have fact checkers and copy editors and you know an entire photo department when you can just aggregate the photos and pull them from stock photos um, and have your reporters do the copy editing and the fact checking. So saying to workers, this used to be your role, but now because we've let go 25, 30, 40, 50 percent of the workforce, you're going to have to do this, 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 and this for the same salary. And that's how you shrink, it's how you, you lower the labor costs and you start to turn a profit. Mm. You're suggesting though that there are other choices you could make. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the choices being made at BuzzFeed and what role is the union playing out of it? I think once kind of BuzzFeed News had the number of here's how many people you have to lay off, it became a, a, a just kind of this triage of, okay, what are the areas that we most want to focus on? Um, and, and I think part of that is looking at like, what is the value that we can bring to the wider media landscape? Um, and I think part of that is consolidating into, okay, so like if you look at our land, newsroom now compared to what was before layoff, now we have tech, politics, and investigations, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, some, some other like a culture desk and some other things around that. Um, and it's just kind of channeling all our resources into what we see as the, the biggest stories in America, as opposed to competing on, you know, 15% of the news media landscape, maybe we compete on like 8% and just focus all our resources there. And I think part of that is because we see our value, not just to our readers, but maybe even to like the shareholders and the people that make money off of us, um, is kind of breaking through through this very chaotic news cycle, mm -hmm. that page views are no longer the currency of the realm, as they seem to be four or five years ago. Now the currency of the realm is kind of this um, prestige of kind of getting your, corp your your brand's name on the CNN cryon for 24 hours, um, you know, breaking through into whatever, like the Axios newsletter in the morning. But this idea of creating impact, changing laws, um, being in the national conversation, I think, is, is now kind of the, the, the mm. value that we see, kind of almost the advertising value that we have. And Vice? I wish that I could tell you there's, there's a rhyme or reason to what they're doing. Uh, I'm sure at a corporate level they've done a lot of calculations and a lot of, you know, they've thought about it a lot. The recent wave of layoffs, everyone who, you know, all the workers were sort of bamboozled. They couldn't quite figure out why so-and-so is laid off or why this is happening. There wasn't a clear plan that was laid out that was presented to us, at least. I am, from what I could tell from reading about it in the press, <laughs> our, um, well, Vice's new CEO is very interested in the television and digital side of the company. Mm -hmm. Editorial seems like it remains an afterthought, which is unfortunate because that's, you know, that was the bedrock of the company. Like, Vice started in Montreal as a punk magazine, 
and the people that are still writing those stories and doing really incredible work have been consistently undervalued, which is part of why we were the first unit to organize and unionize back in 2015. So really, I, I don't know what they're doing, and I'm not entirely sure that they do either. Mm. But I mean, I'm sure somebody who makes a lot more money than I do could come on and t give you a very, mm. you know, a very well thought out, beautiful business plan. But uh, I'm just a worker, and from my perspective, who knows? Yeah. We're going to talk about the union drive. And after your successful one in New York, the Canadians were also organizing. I had a chance to talk with some of them back in 2016 in a May, May Day rally in Washington Square. Here's that clip. What's happening around here is union groups from all across the city are showing up for a May Day rally linking immigrant rights with worker rights. And one of the interesting things that we're finding is that traditional labor is represented as well as the less traditional. I'm sitting, standing here with folks from Vice. You've heard of that online media outlet that also has a television and cable channel these days. Well, they're in a union fight. They've got some good news from north of a border, some more challenging news here. And here to talk about it is... Happy. Tell us a little bit about how you're situated. What's your relationship to this vice union struggle? So as a bargaining unit member who helped bargain since uh, November of 2015, we just, just today uh, unionized, and our president of the company has sort of sent out an email to everybody ratifying our union or sort of letting everybody know that the ratification process is complete and we are a union now. That's exciting. How long has it taken to get to this point? A long time full of blood, sweat, and tears. Blood, sweat, and tears. So tell us about that part of the picture. <laughs> well, I mean, I think... Um, I think, you know, just watching the last few years and this kind of explosion in organizing, it's just been incredibly inspiring, not just to see all of these workplaces organize, but to see how they've all connected in such a way that um, they're sharing resources, they're sharing experiences, they're able to tell their stories through this very effective medium, which is Twitter and other social media platforms. And so I think, I think in that regard, uh, media workers have the benefit of being able to share what's happening internally in their workplaces very publicly. And so that's been beneficial in holding employers accountable, in putting uh, a serious spotlight on potential union busting or any anti-union activity in the workplace that other workers in other industries don't necessarily have the benefit of. So I think that's been really exciting to see that kind of open up a whole space where you have media workers across the landscape connecting with one another and being inspired by their struggles. Um, so in Canada, they were inspired by, um, by the Vice US Union. Um, and actually, we just, when we went public with our campaign at BuzzFeed News in the U.S., our sister local up in Canada that represents those, those uh, vice workers, they went public on the, on the same day with their organizing drive. And we got news that BuzzFeed Germany also announced their intent to form a staff council. Mm. Your union, I think, was not just a product of the post layoff scenario. Uh, this has been in the works for a while, isn't that right? Correct. Um, for some folks that have been involved in the effort years, um, for most folks involved in the effort several months at least. And you actually were able to play a role in the terms on which people were let go. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, that, that didn't um, magically appear out of thin air from Thursday to the Monday where it existed, <laughs> right? There had already been uh, this sort of solidarity amongst folks in the newsroom um, and this kind of sense that we were kind of on this, on, on this track. Um, uh, and I think part of it was like a lot, when a lot of us first got to BuzzFeed, it was kind of this new model, this new business model. And I think we all kind of wanted to give the company the benefit of the doubt and see kind of where this goes and, and how they're going to kind of change media, give them a chance, right? And when the checks are blank, uh, it's very easy to kind of go along with it. And I think once we had seen that kind of uh, this, our, our company, which was supposed to be on the vanguard of figuring out the business model, um, was beginning to struggle. Uh, that 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 the problems that we weren't we weren't immune to the problems hitting the rest of the industry. I think it became clear to many of us that we needed to secure our protections in this kind of turbulent times, and also get a seat at the table yeah. and, and have a say in some of the decisions that are affecting us. Yeah. And has union changed your life, Kim? Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> uh, without the vice union, I so many people would have left. 
it's it really changed everything. Like I was part of the initial man. I've been part of the whole thing. Like there's a reason that they would call me Union Mom. <laughs> um, like I was, I've been part of the whole thing. And um, in the beginning, the reason there are multiple reasons that we organized. Of course, the biggest driving factor back in 2015 was money. Like it was an open secret that wasn't really much of a secret that at that point Vice's compensation packages were far below industry standard, mm -hmm. and people were suffering. Like people couldn't afford to live. And we had the offices in Williamsburg, that's not exactly a place where you can get a sandwich for five dollars. Like <laughs> people have to live in New York. It was, it was people were having a very hard time. And that was a big motivator. And now we're on our second contract for editorial. It's something that I'm very proud of that we managed to get in our latest contract for editorial was the institution of salary floors for every job title. And we weighted that in favor of lower, more junior titles because those are the titles that people who are women or queer, people of color, who are immigrants, the people that get screwed over the most, they're, that's the person that's going to get the, you know, the starting salary, right? So we wanted to make sure that at the very least that starting salary was going to be something reasonable. I mean, I was very low, <laughs> poorly paid, basically throughout my entire tenure. Mm. I would have gotten a really big raise if I hadn't gotten laid off <laughs> a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago, which is fine, you know. But it's, wait, I'm sure it's not fine. Uh, I mean, we do talk kind of blithely about layoffs, and there are real personal costs. Tell me about your friends. Some some people really were devastated. I have a friend who. She's not, she's not American, she's here on a visa. Now she's worried about whether she's gonna have to leave. I have a friend who recently moved into a new apartment, finally, after getting a $10,000 raise, with, and now he doesn't know if he's gonna be able to afford that. Like, there are people, I have a friend who, man, this, this one was the one that made me the angriest, this one person who was the only person from his specific unit who was laid off, who has done incredible work. He was the, one of the very few black voices at Vice, and he was someone who was formerly homeless, who is now making this incredible work, and now mm -hmm. he's thrown back into precarity. Like these are the kind of things that yeah. our corporate overlords don't think about when they're looking at numbers and looking at job titles. Like these are people. Like I might be okay because like I was gonna quit in March anyway, but most people are not. When people have a job that they pour their pour all their 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 life into, because they're working in a creative field, they're making work that they care about they expect to be treated properly and taken care of. Like, no one thinks that they're, they're going to get the 30-year company job anymore. Like, that's not the, the job market we're in. That's not the economy we're in. Like, capitalism is winning. But at the very least, if you're going to pour your heart and soul into, into your work, you should at least be treated like a person mm. and not a number. What are you moving on to yourself? I'm, I'm freelancing. Um, I'm working on a book proposal. I've got a couple really interesting things in the works. Um, I'm doing okay. I had I, I had a, my first piece in the Washington Post the other week. Um, I'm doing a big profile on Sarah Nelson for the New Republic. The, the flight attendant. Union yeah, the president. Yeah, who's who, been on this program? Yeah, she's incredible. Who said who called for a general strike recently? Yeah, she's my favorite. We're gonna get a drink. I can't wait. <laughs> but um, I've been hustling for a long time. You think you'll stay in journalism? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what else am I gonna do? This is what I do. Yeah. So I am. So back to you, Ness. Mm -hmm. Is there a future in which you could see that we calibrate value, investment, return differently mm -hmm. um, and keep our news industry vibrant, growing, mm -hmm. a healthy ecosystem? Mm -hmm. People don't need the kind of venture returns of 33% mm -hmm. or whatever it was they were expecting, but they could get 13 or 10 or 12. Well, I think the only way that's going to happen is by journalists and other media workers continuing to organize um, and there being a degree of public accountability that is so significant that this constantly is at the forefront of our conversations about. I mean, what is media is supposed to be, right, a public good where, you know, the fact that we have local news completely decimated across the country, that's something that matters to every single structure and process that we depend on. Um, so I think that I think that especially with these last few years of local reporting, local or local news organizations getting hit so hard, mm -hmm. look at what happened at the Daily News here in New York. Um, I think the more this is part of the conversation, there is more investment coming in. The Knight Foundation is right, just one of correct. many that has recently so we are seeing a major million dollar exactly. investment in local reporting. Will that make so we're seeing positive developments. Yeah. I mean, nobody wants to rely on billionaire benefactors like the, those that rescued the LA Times from Tronk. 
Um, we want we want different models, and I think that that's part of. I I like Kim. I don't pretend She's to have all Jeff Bezos now. I don't. <laughs> oh, Washington Post. <laughs> I don't pretend to have all of the answers. The worst of Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I don't think any of us pretend. I think if anybody were to say that they have all of the answers, I think the business owners, the workers, we are all trying to figure out how we make this a sane industry where workers can thrive um, and communities can get their news. And so I think that's what we're all trying to do together, is trying to at least bring accountability and attention to these issues. There are some exciting models out there. Um one is um, Republique, a Swiss paper mm -hmm. that has raised a record amount of money online. The other one is the Dutch correspondent that's due to launch mm -hmm. this year. That'll be a different, more. I'm not surprised structure. they're not located in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting new models, though, out there. I mean, this mm -hmm. is something I want to see the entire media pivot to, you know, worker owned cooperative model, because I think that's the only way we're going to see any true equity, any true freedom, any, you know, no one's going to take care of us but us. Even the friendliest billionaire is still a billionaire, so mm -hmm. he's still an exploitative, exploitative deleted, you know? Like there's, we can't depend on venture capitalists. We can't depend on cool billionaires. We can't re even depend, we can't depend on corporations. Like the only people that are gonna continue to push journalism forward are the journalists. And if we're not being supported by these terrible entities, we should just do it ourselves. All like, right, 10 second response from you, Albert. I, I, I'm glad to see you guys' optimism. I think we've seen from the subscription models a lot of places have tried, including us, that people are beginning to be willing to pay money for things online, which I think was not the case for a while. Albert, Nasran, and Kim, thank you so much. Really a great conversation. I look forward to more. This is The Laura Flanders Show. You can find out more at www.lauraflanders.org.